Hi, and welcome to another Manipod podcast with Larry and Mike. And today our guest is Ed Fraunheim. He is a co-author of several books. One we will be speaking about today, which is Reinventing Masculinity. He's also a business coach and consultant to many companies out there, one which I will be calling him in for, which is our ETC business. Um, Ed, welcome. And uh, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Mike and Larry. It's really an honor to be here with you guys. Um, well, I uh, grew up in Buffalo, New York. Um, uh, had a good education, went to college, wanted to be a writer, had a little detour as an educator, uh, but ultimately became a journalist, eventually focusing on workplace culture issues and uh, became a dad, I'm married and have two kids. And um, over time really gravitated to this topic of masculinity that we, ha we have in common, I think, and was realizing that men have to be like, showing up differently in the work world to succeed these days. That was kind of what drove me to co-author that last book, uh, Reinventing Masculinity. So tell us about this. What do you mean by we have to discover our masculinity or reinvent it? What, what does that mean? My co-author and I think we are moving from what we're calling a confined masculinity, a very limited way of being a man that we've been kind of socialized to be for thousands, several thousand years, really, uh, where we had certain roles and certain ways of relating. You could be the provider, protector, conqueror, and you had to be stoic and self-reliant. Um, but these ways don't really serve us so well in the world that's emerging, uh, that you really can, your risk of showing up as isolated, cold, and, and rigid in a world that's calling for warmth, agility, and connection. So we talk about breaking out of that confined, uh, limited way of being a man to a liberating masculinity, where men are really free to, to show up in new ways, you know, be more connected, be more compassionate, take on new roles like the caregiver and the spiritual seeker. And this is really playing out, we think, in the work world and beyond. And so, you know, uh, in the pre versus post COVID world, um, a lot of the ideas that you have been writing about for many years uh, are, are kind of becoming reality in the sense that people don't want to put up with an imperial boss that tells them what to do rather than works with them on trying to get the job done. Speak to that. I think you, you put it well, Larry. Um, <clears throat> we talk about moving from that barking boss. I like the word imperial boss too, kind of the Darth Vader boss mm -hmm. um, to a caring coach where really people are expecting to be developed over time and be given a lot of respect and dignity. That's really at the heart of the, the work of the Great Place to Work Institute where I was at, was at for several years. Um, and it is a really important shift because work was killing us. You know, literally it was is deadening our souls and taking shaving lives off of our, uh, you know, of our lifespans. Research from Stanford has pointed out that 120,000 people in America die prematurely every year because of work stress that comes from bad management, which largely boils down to that imperial boss thing you talked about. And so people are really waking up in COVID and saying, really, is this, is this all there is? You know, am I, am I gonna, life is short, you know, I'm facing my mortality. Let me, let me try to find a place that's gonna be better for me, <clears throat> where I feel good about work, where I feel I have a sense of purpose and I'm taken seriously, my ideas are listened to. So it's really this move toward more coaching in, in that sort of a supportive way, as opposed to the sort of a dictating way. And the end so, results are often better. You wrote in one of your articles, collaboration and persuasion are more productive than solo displays of dominance. Uh, and I think that's kind of sums up what you're talking about is you can get more done in a better way if you work together and you care about the people you're working with than using the whip and trying to get them to do stuff. That's well put. And, and the research we found in, in a book I co-authored called A Great Place to Work for All was that the most highest performing managers on measures of productivity, retention, agility, innovation, they were ones that were, were just like you described, Larry. They, they created caring bonds for their people. They also share the spotlight so that everybody can get credit, not just them at the top. Um, they were basically caring uh, coaches in effect. Um, and they really focused on the purpose too, so that which is a real calling for people these days. Let me do something that has meaning. Uh, and so those were the bosses that got the most out of their teams. So it's really been proven out, as you say, that's just one of many studies that indicates that this high road approach really does lead to higher, higher business results. 
You know, we, we've been um, for the last two years working from home on and off. And how do you coach a company, small company that where they're allowing a lot of their staff to work from home? How do you get everybody together to to have some some sort of um, coherent team? How, how do you do that? I think one of the things that I've been observing and seeing in my clients and the work I'm doing is that it's not just you're giving a, getting everybody together. It's a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, so you're building relationships. That's the thing that Great Place to Work has found is it's really the quality of the relationship that makes a workplace great more than its programs or its perks. And so those leaders really are called to have a, a bond with people. Um, and that's that's hard for a lot of men because we're, 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 hmm. we tend to be that more walled off stoic you know, like we're not going to ask how you're doing in a real meaningful way. Like, tell me about your challenges right now. And are you, are you OK? Are you depressed? Are you anxious? You know, are you, are you sad? Um, but that's where where the standout companies and leaders are, are. That's where they're going. And I think then, you know, when you do pull, pull people together, there are some practices like what we call check ins where you're asking people, how are you doing? And, and it's not just a superficial thing, but it's really a chance for people to share uh, you know, what's going on, joys as well as sadnesses. And that's, uh, you know, strengthen teams and allow them to be more collaborative and effective in this difficult time. Do you think people are less stressed now because they get to work from home? Or do you think that has put a lot of stress on them because they may not have a great place to work in their house or they have children at home, they have dogs and cats? And, you know, how, how has that changed? I, what I see is mixed results, Mike. I think the companies that started off with a pretty high trust culture got better. We actually did see that in the data. And the ones that were more toxic, you know, less, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, caring, less collaborative, they tended to, to you know, first there was a, a, an increase in productivity, but then it nosedived because there was a certain amount of, okay, I'm going to work really hard to make sure I don't get fired during this crisis, but then it wasn't sustainable. Uh, so I think um, people have generally wanted to have a mix of this. I want to work more flexibly at home and, and versus in the office, but whether the company overall got better, had a lot to do with how they started, you know, and whether they continue these, these higher trust practices, which again, called on men to, to show up in some different ways than we've been, we've been taught to. You know, I think um, again, the, uh, the COVID uh, situation has, has resulted in an awakening uh, in in several aspects. One is, I think, a lot of people and you know companies now are struggling to find people to come back to work, right? And part of it is they realized I don't need to work that hard for ten dollars an hour. And so uh, even my McDonald's down the street here is offering fifteen, sixteen dollars an hour, right? Because they have to, because it's going to take that to get people to come back to work physically. But I think they've also realized that they're an asset because the companies can't really do anything without them. And they're realizing with me working from home, I have the opportunity to grab a cup of coffee. I have the opportunity to say hi to my kid. And they're, they're seeing work in a different way. And there, there have been a couple of reports that have come out recently showing that a lot of people that now are working from home are actually more productive than they were when they were actually having to drive to work every day and and be there. Yeah, I, what I think you're getting at, Larry, is this importance to human beings of autonomy. Yeah, like we, we don't want to be bossed around. And, right. And, but so many of our workplaces for years right. had a model that was industrial or military, and it's this chain of command, and you're, you get direction, you get directions instead of direction. So right. That you're, instead of a, a general goal. To, to shoot for and then you get to decide how you're going to get there you're given this micromanaged set of, of, of rules to follow often in these workplaces and it it kills the spirit so it's not i agree with you it's it, people are often more productive at home because they get to pick when they're going to take their dog on a walk when they're going to take a, a nap you know when they're going to do do a get, a get a coffee break so yes to what you're saying and i think i hope that it stays this way because we're, we're happier when we are more free, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, so somebody has to change, right? And it's usually the CEO or, or the manager has to change first, and then it trickles down. So do you coach one-on-one -on -one with a CEO or, or a manager of a company? How, how does that work with your coaching? 
I have worked with C-suite leaders uh, and sometimes lower level leaders as well. And a lot of it is, is just cracking that veneer of, I only talk about the numbers, you know, or I only talk about the strategy. It's letting them be more fully human. You know, like what, what, what jazzes you up about this company? Because, you know, one of my clients is, they're a great business, a uh, great workplace. You know, they've been a certified great workplace and on the Fortune 100 best list. And they're struggling with uh, questions about retention and, and engagement. And partly it's because I don't think they've, those leaders have really gotten an inspirational message out. It was for a long time, it was like, we're just, just the facts, ma'am. And just, we're strictly business. Uh, and there's a call now for people to connect authentically, you know? And so when leaders can say, you know what, I love this company because I love the founder and, and their success story, or I love the way our company serves the needy of America. Um, those things, they jazz people up. And, and when you can acknowledge that you've gone through a mental crisis yourself, as, as one of the leaders I'm coaching is, that just, it, that cracks open hearts and makes people like, damn, I want to work for these people, you know, because they're, they are walking the walk, walking the talk. And, and, and it's, it's inspiring. So, you know, uh, it wasn't a cliche, but it was well understood, particularly back in the seventies and eighties that in Japan, a lot of men were dropping dead from heart attacks at 45 at 50 uh, they were working 100 hours a week. Their family lives were ruined. They, uh, you know, they were under extreme uh, stress. And, and, you know, that has to a slightly lesser extent been the case here. You also wrote masculine success has historically been about pay, promotions and power and about climbing over others in the rat race and up an ever narrow corporate ladder. Now, uh, I, I immediately thought of my surgical training uh, program, which was a pyramid, mm. where it started with about 18 interns, and you finished with three chief residents. And wow. so in between there, people got cut. So you had to be up front answering questions, almost bullying to make sure that you were, were noticed. Mm. And talk about stress. So... Do you think that uh, like in business schools, I mean, I didn't go to business school, but is there, is that still sort of the mantra that's being taught there? Or do you think there's an intrinsic knowledge on the part of younger people to say, I'm not going to work that way? I think we're in a transition, Larry. I think there is growing appreciation of what you just described as unhealthy uh, that we're, we're, we focus too much on competition. That's another one of these, I would call masculine traits or tropes uh, that we're constantly seeing each other as rivals <clears throat> as opposed to collaborators. Um, and definitely the young, younger people are, are, are less focused on that. They're much more critical of capitalism and it's, it's fundamental com competitive nature. They're much more open, open to socialism, you know, whatever that means, but certainly a little more collective in, in nature. Um, and, you know, uh, your point about the heart attack is true. Like I grew up in, in that era where we were supposed to climb that ladder, you know, and I, I you guys know, I, I had a heart attack last last year with some of these same stress factors at play uh, that really, you know, make me wake up just to some of my own and take my own medicine, really. And you had no family history of heart disease. It was primarily the stress and anxiety and and all the other stuff that was happening in your life that probably induced that. That is pretty correct. I mean, I had some, some relatives have had heart problems, but not the kind I had. I had what's called a coronary artery spasm mm -hmm. where your blood vessel literally goes, you probably know this, like it clenches. It's, there yeah. wasn't a blockage yeah. and, and it comes out of stress or cocaine and meth. And I'm not a cocaine. Oh. Or meth. <laughs> and yeah, so your teeth pretty are much, pretty good. So yeah, your uh, teeth are all right. Okay. Uh, so it's probably the stress of, of taking on too many projects, trying to, you know, make, make ends meet for my family parenting my teens, helping them learn how to drive, you know, a lot of those things all added up, I think. And uh, I needed to like slow down, really kind of take stock of, of, of what I'd said about letting in the support, letting in the care and the compassion of others. You know, uh, we talked about, in my co-author and I, about um, an arrow and circle, uh, you know, the masculine symbol has got the circle and then the arrow sticking out of it. And so many men forget about the circle. We're all about the arrow, that like directionality, the aggressiveness, um, the purpose. But we don't see the circle, which is more receptive, more uh, communal, I think. And 
it lets in the love, you know, and, and uh, that's what I needed to do in the wake of this heart attack. And I think uh, there's a lesson for probably a lot of us men to kind of remember that we're not just those hard charging warriors. You know, we're also part of the community and we've got feminine sides to ourselves that we'd be better off acknowledging and expressing if we want to have healthy, happy lives. You know, um, our logo has that round circle that you're talking about. And the pause in the middle says, hey, everybody, take a pause, relax, follow your passion, enjoy yourself. You know, and that's kind of the take that we, you know, what we're trying to achieve with our company is enjoy your life and, and follow your passions, even after your retirement, right? But you suffered this heart attack and you've written all these books and you're about the workplace and, and just reinventing the masculinity. Why do you think you suffered that? I mean, why, why are you so stressed out? And how old were you and how did you feel when it hit you? It's, I'm kind of ashamed I had a heart attack. I should have been, if anyone should have avoided a heart attack, it would be me, Mike. Right. Um, but I think it's, that shows you how powerful these influences are on us as guys, I think. Because even though I had written about this stuff, written about the importance of, of you know, blending male and female energies, if you will, uh, about, you know, having a more positive work, healthy work environment, I still was taking too much on. I still was letting my, my anger and temper flare, you know, uh, I'm, when I didn't need to, when my kids made a wrong turn, when I'm driving with them. Um, so, you know, I think that shows the, how, how strong these influences are of that confined masculinity. I was 54 uh, or 53. I guess I was just about to be turned 54. And mm -hmm. it really did get me to realize that this is true for a lot of guys. There's a, there's a way in which a heart attack can break your masculinity. That's a, a research term that people came up with. When guys had heart attacks, they really lost part of their identity as a strong, invincible guy. And mm -hmm. I, yeah. well, that affected me too. And I was realizing how I really needed to like further listen to what the stuff I don't, I'd said, you know, and, and lean into, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to need help. You know, it doesn't, you don't, it's like pause, like you said, and like your, 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 your philosophy is right there in front of me. And I, I agree with it to like, what do I really want to do? And I don't have to constantly achieve. That's also that arrow energy of like, we're nothing if we're not everything. And, and I think that I've really been able to reflect on that more carefully since then. Well, and, and uh, I was just looking up some st statistics uh, yesterday and 70% of all the suicides in 2020 were middle-aged white males. Wow. And that, that speaks to the, is since we know that many of these middle-aged white males are in the corporate structure, that uh, that, that that you know is 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 meaningful. But I want to I want to just real quickly twist this for a minute, and 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 throw out whether we're infecting women, because when you see some of these new corporate female leaders, many of them have the same traits, the same aggressive, I'm the boss traits that the white men uh, who have been in control all this time have. And so obviously that's something they either learned in business school or was something they were forced to learn to actually make it in the corporate world. How do you address that? You're right. And a lot of women have had to play this game, Larry, and, and a lot of them have been just as ruthless. But I loved how you talked about your pyramid with the, with the surgery program, like bullying others out of the way, you know, I think of the shoulder pads women were wearing in the eighties. Like it's almost like equipment, <laughs> right, to, right, right, <laughs> to look bigger, you know. And yeah. and uh, but I think there is a change underway again because we just great place to work just did a study um, where it found out one of the top things women want to see differently in workplaces is a more compassionate workplace. There is a way in which women are kind of owning those feminine qualities and and uh, if not qualities like these sort of like yin and yang type traits around um, compassion, connection, uh, a, a focus on the means, not just the ends. And, you know, they're, they're changing workplaces. And, I, and I, I would ask you about your medical field. Like women are now the majority of the professionals in the medical field. You know, and I, I wonder if that, if you're seeing a change in the way things are managed because of that, Larry. Well, it's interesting because um, uh, women are now, women patients are now choosing to go to women doctors with a few exceptions. 
and um, uh, and women are, are like, for instance, at my hospital, 75 percent of the trauma surgeons are women. I mean, wow. unthinkable 30 years ago. Right. They're handling and, uh, broken, yeah. broken legs. Okay. Yeah. And yet a lot, you know, uh, some depending on the specialty they're in, some of some of the female surgeons are as um, hard as the men. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that has to do with with the program. I mean, I, a lot of women came up with me and they had to be just as obnoxious and tough and bullying as the guys or they were out. And so I, that's what I'm saying is I think mm -hmm. if uh, even today, if a woman is coming up in a corporate world and it's not her own company where she doesn't get to make the rules, by the time she gets to the top, she may be as much of an asshole as as a, a middle aged white guy that gets up there. Right. right. I, I don't I think again, I think we're in a transition point because of me, me too, for example, said women are not going to tolerate the assholicness, especially when it gets to harassment. Right. Um, and at least at the best workplaces, those cultures are making it more possible for women to, you know, to, to be who they are. Uh, you know, not that they're all, you know, cuddly and 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 purely kind uh you know they're but they, some of them yeah they, they can right. they can bring those 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 traits or qualities but i think um it's less the case that they have to be those hard-edged bullies mm -hmm. that, in the past because or you know they're speaking up you know it's an era of social media and and those in cases where where men are maybe forcing that kind of a culture people are calling it out you know so i think I think it's a hopeful time for both men and women to be more whole, whole human beings, you know, where they don't have to just bring the, the, the fight. They can also bring the, the friendship. Right. Right. I, I, I agree. And I, I, we have a lot of women that work in our company and we're in the healthcare uh, construction company and we are hiring women left and right because they bring a balance to our our company that we've never seen before. Right. And, and we love it. And I have two daughters and Larry has two daughters and we, you know, we support women. Right. But, you know, or else, pardon? <laughs> or else, or else. That's right. Uh, but you were talking about 70% of the suicides are, are men, right. Staying relevant in the workplace is a very depressing thing for an aging male. Okay. And, I can see, you know, even myself, how do I stay relevant in my company? Even though I'm uh, the CEO of it, there are people, there are people coming up that I, you know, how do I stay? Um, well, I know the word is relevant, but how do I stay in connection and keep, mm -hmm. keep that passion going with my, with my work? How do you advise somebody like that? So they don't go into a depression. I would say start with being open about your concern. You know, I think that's one of the things we were told is to as guys is don't show feelings, don't show that you're you're weak or you're vulnerable in any way. To me, that's one of the now the strengths. That's a that's a superpower to say, you know what, I'm worried about staying relevant in this company mm -hmm. and things change. And and I want your help. You know, I wanna I wanna be part of what brings us to the next level or the next era. Um you know, and, and have some conversations about what is it, what, what kind of leadership do you need from me? You know, and here are some of my concerns. Here are some of what I think are strengths, but just being more honest than ever about what you're experiencing, including your fears. You know, that's what we were told never to do, but it's actually the opposite that, that is effective these days. Interesting. So, um, I just want to point out one thing and then I want to switch to a different topic. And there was a, there was a twilight zone episode. Of course, this was in the sixties uh, that, that spoke to this. It was called Willoughby. I don't know if you ever saw it. And it was so. about this guy uh, trapped in the, in a rat race and he would take the train home and, and fall asleep. And he would dream of this old idyllic town called Willoughby and, uh, and pined to go there. And I'm not going to give away the ending, but, but it, it should be watched if you want to see what workplace stress can do to somebody. But what I want to talk about now is, is competition. Cause I was reading a couple of your articles about competition and, and, and I, I either have a, a slightly different view than you have, or I didn't quite understand your view. 
And your view was, uh, and this happened to be about uh, you playing disc golf and, yes. and that you were totally bummed out when you lost and went into a depression, uh, almost as if you felt like a loser because you had been practicing and you lost. And so my takeaway from the article was, was maybe different or I misunderstood it. My takeaway was um, don't give up competition, uh, but also don't put too much into it. So, you know, like if Mike and I uh, play tennis or whatever and I lose, I lose. That doesn't make me a loser unless I. In in this case, it does. (laughs) Unless unless I tell myself that I'm a loser. Right. Right. Because, you know, I think you have to prioritize your value to yourself. In, in other words, what makes me who I am and what makes me the kind of person that I am? And if I lose at ping pong or I lose at poker, does that does, does that define my whole life and make me a loser? And so the, the impression I got from your article was that you were really intensely affected by losing that competition. So mm-hmm. tell me tell me what you meant by that and, and how that can be corrected. You uh, articulated it fairly, Larry, um, and I, I like what you're saying, and I would agree that it's that's the healthy thing to say. I'm not going to define myself a loser if I lose a game of tennis, even, even if it's to Mike, and I keep losing to Mike. It's, I don't, I'm not sure if that's what happens. Um, but well, he's but, so but short I, that you know, he's, yeah. when he comes up to the net, I can't even see it, and I'm so oh, wide, no. I'm so <laughs> wide, he can't get the ball past me. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is what I what the what I was trying to get at the article is that it's easier said than done to define yourself as not a loser when you lose in our society because what I think happens is that we are swimming in a sea of competition that we don't even notice it's like the fish not seeing the water and that I notice this maybe more than ever when I raised my own kids virtually everything that we did with them was competitive right from the from the get go it's soccer games it's it's um, swimming classes that eventually become a team. It, it's uh, you know, rock climbing that also became competitive. Um, so what I started realizing is that I'm a sensitive guy. So I kind of think of myself maybe as the sort of canary in the coal mine. But what I have, have experienced over time is like this just does like hurt my soul, not only to, to lose, but also to win. If, because I think the winning can easily transform into like, I'm the best I'm better. That's what winning and losing is about. Like I'm better than you. And that is fundamentally divisive between human beings. And I don't think we'd be paying up attention to this culture of division, which I think we're now seeing in the political realm. We're like, you know, a lot of the populist movements around the world are saying, screw that. I'm not worse than you. I I, I refuse to let the rich define, you know, be, be better than me. And that's that's very deeply in our roots as human beings, going back to our hunter gatherer times, where we were we really limited the amount of rivalry and competition. And so I'm just I'm trying to call attention to the fact that we may want to think about a, a less competitive climate in in our world. Don't you think though? I mean, it, it's kind of part of human nature to compete, uh, and I think it's all about how we define uh, either as individuals or as a as a as a culture or civilization what that means. I mean, you're right. Politically right now, people take ridiculous positions only because they feel like if they give an inch, they'll, they'll look like losers. Right. And so I think it's the, it's the definition of competition. That's a problem. And so, you know, it's, it's not the end all be all to say, you know, like for instance, we, we uh, are doing a video on pickleball and Mike took, got it right away. And I was struggling, you know, I don't care. I didn't go home and say, I suck at pickleball. You know, uh, it was like, <laughs> you okay. you're talking about it right now. So you must have done that. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like, so what, you know, right. uh, that that's not the kind of kind of competition that should, I think, manifest itself in a negative way in your life. And so I think it really, it, it, you know, it may have to be up to, you know, because, you know, you hear this criticism, which I think to a certain degree is true, that every kid gets a trophy, right? right. Uh, on every team, every kid gets a trophy. And I think that kind of diminishes the idea of getting a trophy. You know, I don't have too many trophies 
Uh, but I don't care. I mean, that's that doesn't keep me up at night. Uh, now, I guess it would be much more relevant if if your um, vocation was sports, right? And and that's your job as a tennis player, and then you constantly lose. I think that could make you feel like a loser because that's who you are. You're a golfer or a tennis player. But for most normal people that have other jobs and careers, to pay, to play casual tennis or casual, you know, touch football or something like that. It's just for fun. And yeah, if you lose, great. I will win next time. Right. I, I Well, I would say that I'm, I'm not calling for the end of competition. Uh, but what I am realizing in my own life, at least, is I wanted to have a balance between comp competition and non-competition or collaboration. And with my one buddy who I mentioned in the article, Larry, I was realizing almost every time we get together, we were battling each other. And yeah. We weren't like having beers together. We were like in, in, a, in a rival risk context yeah and so we just started you know what let's balance that out we're just we're just gonna throw the frisbee back and forth you know or just practice sh shooting the frisbee at the at the trees or whatever we want to do but that actually made a big difference to me and i yeah. think i actually won my last frisbee golf game by the way all right I, you're a winner man you're a winner he's a loser you know what, you know what, you know what you? this is a little <laughs> maybe we're going down this rabbit hole of this but i was realizing i needed to like forgive myself for those times that I had lost, because I think we do right. deeply feel like losers as guys, especially. And we, you know, you guys, we, we talked about this off, off, off camera, but being from Buffalo, there's my buddies from Buffalo. We are like seared at the soul level that the bills have lost four Super Bowls and oh, not believe me. I I felt that pain too. Okay. You're, you're oh my us. God. Yeah. We, we obsess about the bills and, yeah. and how, whether, how they can win the championship and it cuts very deeply, I think, because we don't notice this competitive water, as I said. Yeah. And so I'm calling for more non-competitive stuff to, 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 to balance out the ways we're constantly fighting. Essentially. Well, I think the key is recognition. I mean, Mike and I pick on each other all the time when we have to, like when we're on or, or you know, in a crowd or something like that. But when, when he and I are together... I mean, we don't do that because we're right. talking about other things. So I think you have to really define, you know, what it is that you're, why you're competing. So we compete when we're on camera or when we're doing this for fun, for entertainment, for, you know, to make a point. But, but um, I think, I think people have to come up with their own self-definition of what does it mean that I'm now going to go out this morning and play golf with Mike? Does that mean if he beats me, you know, I'm going to be ruined for the whole weekend? Or does it mean like, hey, you know, well, uh, I'll play better next time. I think that's a mental thing that people are going to have to work out because uh, competition's yeah. always going to be there. Right. Yeah. This is this has been great, Ed. And if if you were to sum up what we've discussed today, how would you do that with uh, advising us as business people and as guys that are in their 60s, where are we going and how do we follow our passion? What, what, what do you say? There is more. There, there's, <laughs> there's a different way. There's a possible uh, greater fulfillment in life and freedom and fun. If you can kind of take stock, you know, to your point, Larry, like recognize the ways we've been taught to be men. And I think that if we do recognize the ways we have been pretty limited, confined in our masculinity, and then we are willing to sort of like break out a bit and, and challenge those assumptions that we're not supposed to be uh, vulnerable, we're not supposed to share our feelings, we're not supposed to get help even, you know, that, um, that there's a lot more richness to life, you know, and, and, and even, to, again, your guys' show name is so great on this menopause, you don't even have can we challenge the notion that we have to succeed to feel good about ourselves? Because right. that again is like a, a part of that arrow piece that ignores just like appreciating the moment, you know? Right. And so I think if we, if I can leave that one message, it would be like, there's more to life as guys. And we, there's a, it, it takes kind of questioning how we've been raised, but there's a lot of goodness on the other side of it. Yes, yes. that's, that's great. great. And, and uh, everybody check out, we're going to uh, put the uh, address on Amazon for Ed's books. Uh, definitely check them out. Check out his articles on menopause.com because they're, they're really interesting. And, and, and as you can see, they stir all this, 
this conversation. Oh yeah. And uh, and Ed, thanks so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. And and one one thing to add, if you are a company that is struggling to stay relevant or work with your people in a, a more productive way in this new environment, uh, reach out to Ed because he's a great coach. Thanks, Larry and Mike. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you.